Good morning, lovely friends. We're inside again. It's raining outside. Hey, let's pray and welcome the Lord as we start our new saunter or an, another saunter in the book of Luke. Jesus, we love you. We invite you to be with us today. Come and speak to us and be so real. Lord, let, let this not just be like, oh, we're looking back into history but let this be, we're looking at now and what you are wanting to do right now among us in your glorious name. Amen. So hi everyone and welcome. Here we go, we're in Luke chapter 10. So we're talking about the doctor and the miracle worker. So Dr. Luke is looking at these incredible things that Jesus is doing. He's not just there as a kind of sceptical reporter. He's there as a participant and a an active disciple. And uh, he must have been looking on in total amazement. Good morning, Fran. And watching some of the th some of the things he writes about are just so extraordinary and so beyond science and so beyond the realms of what we would expect in medicine and so on. So um, verse one. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others. So he'd sent out 12. They'd come back. They'd been pretty good. They'd been very excited. Jesus had been very excited. Um, they'd come back and had some kind of slightly disappointing results, trying to do some other things. But we'd had that incredible moment on the mountain where Jesus is transfigured. He's been gazing on his father and now he's his literally his whole appearance is transformed and transfigured and he's flashing like lightning he's beautiful and glorious and the disciples are in on this incredible experience and so after this the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them out on ahead of him two by two into every town and place where he himself was about to go and he said to them the harvest is plentiful but the laborers are few Pray therefore earnestly that the Lord of the har to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way, and behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Wow, this is really interesting. Let's just pause there a second. So Jesus is now sending out a second wave of people into his kind of ministry field he's seeing it as a harvest field and he's saying we need harvesters out there we need god to send out combine harvesters into this thing to get the harvest in but he's we we say oh lord send out laborers but what the word there when he says pray therefore earnestly to the lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest this word send out, to send out laborers, is the Greek word ekbalo. And it's literally from the same, the, the from that word balo, we get the words like ballistic and ball. And all of these words that are to do with throwing and projecting a projectile, um, sending a rocket into space, blast off this whole idea. It's this idea of casting out, throwing out with force, with some measure of violence, throwing them out. And so what he's saying is we need the Lord of the harvest, who presumably is Jesus, or maybe he's referring to the Father and saying, come on, we need to get on our knees and pray to the Father that he'll literally put a rocket down the trousers of every one of the potential laborers and thrust them out into the harvest. Get them out there, push them out. And I really do believe that if ever there was a time, that if ever there was a time Britain needed some laborers to be ek ballowed, to be kind of rocketed out into the harvest field, it's now. I think the Brits are very, very good at coming up with all kinds of excuses of why it's not a good time, why this is a bad idea, why it's not my ministry, etc., etc. But Jesus is saying that there's a plentiful harvest out here, but we don't have so many laborers. And so he's saying, right, go your way. And here's the job description. I'm sending you out as lambs among wolves. <laughs> that's, that sounds like great fun, doesn't it? What a lovely way to spend your day. Go out as a lamb amongst wolves. You are literally, you've got, 
a target on your back and it's hunting season. Oh man, this is this is not good. So he's saying, carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, greet no one on the way. It's like, man, you're not even going to kind of build friendships en route. You're not going to have long conversations with passers-by about the weather and what you're doing and, you know, all this kind of other stuff. But actually, you literally, you are there with a focus and I'm sending you out. I don't even want you to go prepared with any kind of lunch or rucksack with your food in, or any of these things. No sandals. I mean, doesn't Jesus even read the Bible? You're supposed to wear, if you're preaching the gospel, you're supposed to have your feet shod with the gospel of peace <laughs> in the armor of God, Ephesians 6. Oh man, but these guys going out without sandals on. This is amazing. Barefoot evangelism. What is the point of all of this? So anyway, and this is the method. So that's the mission and the kind of equipment. This is visiting, this is James Bond visiting Q and being told, right, you have to go barefoot and you're not allowed to take any gadgets or any preparation. You're just going to go into this thing where you are literally lunch. And he says, this is the job. This is how you're going to do it. Whatever house you enter, say, uh, sorry, whatever house you enter first, say, peace to this house and if a son of peace is there your peace will rest on him now shalom is a hebrew greeting and this is really what he's saying it's that like you're gonna bring you're speaking a blessing of peace over the house but what jesus is talking about is more than just a courtesy and a formality he expects peace to happen right here we go let's look at it again Whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. But if not, it will return to you. So he says he sees the peace that these guys carry through the Holy Spirit, through the gift of God, through the anointing, the Christing, shall I dare say, of the Holy Spirit that's in these guys. He expects it to be an active force that can be passed on. So that when they come in, they bring peace, they dispense it into the household. But there, if there isn't a man, a son of peace in that house, that someone who's receptive to them, then their peace will just come back to them. So it's not like they've wasted anything. It just comes or they've lost anything. It comes back to them um, and remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide. <clears throat> so he's saying this is you, it's it's OK to eat and drink what is set before you. Um, for the labourer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. This is interesting. He said, don't kind of move around until you find the most comfortable lodgings. Stay where you are. Eat what is set before you. Receive their hospitality. Allow yourself to receive. You are going out to give, but actually don't be so pompous that you can't receive receive their kindness, sleep in the bed they give you, eat the food they give you. I, oh man, you, um, let's not get talking about, let's not, let's not go there about preachers, hotel requirements and all the rest of it, because they're so famous and stuff. But, oh, there's something about being welcomed into the house of ordinary people and just experiencing their kindness and their hospitality is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And, and Jesus is saying, don't go from house to house. What, whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you, heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom them for that town right good morning peter pete and Jer uh, clive sorry um he says right you're going to go into this town you're going to go into the house and eat what's set before you heal the sick so the eating bit i can do that's easy i can easily eat the food but it's the heal the sick what are you kidding me i'm not a doctor so luke's <laughs> listening to all of this writing it down and noting, he doesn't comment, does he? He doesn't say, 
These guys, they're not even doctors. They shouldn't be doing this. He knows that they've been given authority by the great physician, the one who literally heals just with a word. And Luke knows that these guys carry that that authority, that anointing to do that. Anyway, and he says, this is your job. You're to go into the house, eat their food, but don't just eat their food. Heal the sick. Anyone who's sick, take care of any need. Like we could, we could kind of modernize it, but I think we cannot get away from this thing about healing. I really do believe that healing is part of the gospel. I do think it's much easier to do the preaching first and then the healing second. But Jesus is like saying, right, your job is heal them. And then when they're excited about the healing, tell them why it happened, which is actually a really good method, isn't it? And he says, the kingdom of God has, tell them the kingdom of God has come near you. So what he's saying is you are having a brush today with the kingdom of God, this other realm this dimension of the glory and power of God has come into your house today and this is what has brought these things about wow so then he says it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for the the town who doesn't receive you so he's saying literally I am giving you this glorious gift but it's actually important that they receive you if they don't it would be better for Sodom. You know, I mean, goodness, Sodom was judged by God with fire from heaven and consumed it. So he's saying, these guys are going to fare better than the people who reject you and reject your message. <clears throat> Verse 13, he says, Woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, for the mighty works done in you. Sorry, for if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable in the judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you, and for you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You shall be brought down to Hades. The one who hears you, hears me, and the one who rejects you, rejects me, and the one who rejects me, rejects the one who sent me. Good morning, George. Good to see you. And so this is really, this is so provocative. This is not friendly. This is not kind of nice, cosy, fluffy bunny Jesus. This is hard-hitting unflinching, uncompromising Jesus. And he's saying these communities who receive you are actually receiving me. And if they're receiving me, they're receiving the one who sent me, which is God himself. The ones who reject you are rejecting me. They're rejecting God himself. This is really, really important. It's this kind of thing that brings judgment onto a community if they reject the message of the servants of God, there is a judgment, an accountability. And what, what, God is, what Jesus is saying here is, I've given you so many signs and wonders and miraculous evidences to perform among these people. They should believe. They will have no excuse in not believing if you are carrying out these miracles like I am. They, there really is no excuse and then therefore they will have to face God's judgment. I think at the moment what we're seeing in my town at any rate is a limited measure of the miraculous. And, and so in a sense you could say people have got a bit of wiggle room, they've got a bit of an excuse. They're not seeing healings and miracles being done by Christians every single day. That's more of something that we get excited about when it happens once in a while. Sadly, we need more. We need more. And just, wow, and I am pressing in for more. But there is something that when the miracles and the really raw, authentic power of God is evident in a community that heightens that sense of culpability. They, they've had the message. They've seen the signs. They've seen the evidence of God at work. Now it's very important that they hear that message and respond to it otherwise they're guilty of openly rejecting it so um verse 17 the 72 returned with joy so they jesus sent them out now they're coming back and it says they returned with joy saying lord even the demons are subject to us in your name and he said to them i saw satan fall like lightning from heaven behold I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. This is really important. Over all the power of the enemy. 
and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And so he said, yeah, this is awesome, isn't it? I've given you this authority and actually I've seen Satan fall from heaven like lightning. I've seen what happens to him. I've seen his end. Um, Jesus also referred to Satan as the prince of this earth. He did, He's not denying that Satan's got authority. He says he's the prince of this earth. And he so he clearly has some authority here in the earthly terrestrial domain. But Jesus is saying, I've seen, I know where, I know what happens to Satan. And he, he is cast down. Even now he's cast down from heaven. But there will be a time when his descent is final into that, that bottomless pit, whatever judgment that is that awaits him, which is amazing. But Jesus is saying, yes, and I've given you all, all authority over all of the power of the enemy. This is amazing, isn't it? He says, I've given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions. And I think by that we might well read de demonic spirits, demonic powers and so on. I've given you authority to tread on them. And that obviously as well fulfills the prophecy in the book of Genesis that you'll crush the, the seed of the, the woman will crush the serpent's head, the descendants of the woman. Um, and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall hurt you. It's amazing, isn't it? Wow. But he says, don't don't just get swallowed up in your own greatness, in your own significance. Celebrate the fact that your name is written in heaven, that actually you're among those who are redeemed. Come on, Paul. Yes, I believe you received a miracle. Thank you, Jesus. I was talking to someone yesterday who also received a miracle at Fresh Start. He was healed of cancer in his arm. He showed me where it had been. It's completely gone. And Jesus, you did it. We prayed. You did it. <laughs> what, what, what is our part in it? Well, we prayed. Yes, good. Well done for that. Good morning, Raymond. Great to see you. Um, so here we go. Um, nevertheless, rejoice that, you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Verse 21, in that same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. Oh, I love that. Jesus is not so Oh, yeah, of course, I know all this stuff. Yeah, oh, yeah, I knew that was going to happen. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. I told you to do that, didn't I? That was my power, obviously. Yeah, yeah. He's not doing that. He's actually super excited that these 72 have got it and that they're doing this stuff. And he rejoices in the Holy Spirit. He just is overjoyed. He's leaping up and down with joy. And he says, I thank you, Father, that you've hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. <laughs> it's just if you think you're going to get proud that God's using you and he's kind of doing the things he promised he would do through you, read this. You're a little child. <laughs> just before you get conceited and start opening your website and your ministry and giving it all these bells and whistles, just remember that you are a little child and that's the kind of people that he reveals this stuff to. And so it's, that's how it's meant to be. And he says, all these things have been handed to me by my father. And no one knows who the son, sorry. All these things have been handed over to me by my father and no one knows who the son is except the father or who the father is except the son and anyone to whom the son chooses to reveal him so he's saying this process of revelation of seeing god of understanding who the father is who the son is that is our job we are bringing revelation the father and son are bringing revelation by the holy spirit into your hearts and your minds and to the hearts and minds of little children he says doesn't he then turning to the disciples he says Blessed are the eyes that see what you see, for I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Good morning, Pat and Mike. Great to see you. 
this is this is so interesting, isn't it? Jesus is very, very aware of the history and the context he's operating in. He's aware that there were generations and generations of God fearing men and women who had gone before who longed to see the kind of stuff that these guys were seeing, that these ordinary disciples were seeing. You you can imagine, can't you? I mean, Moses and Elijah being two of them, obviously. And he says, your eyes are so, are especially blessed. Um, and many prophets and kings desired to see what you see and didn't see it. Verse 25, and behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Lawyers. Ah. So they had this very extensive knowledge of what the law of Moses and the scriptures and the commentaries and the different things said um, and were enshrined in the law. And he's now standing up. He's like their debating champ who's going to put Jesus to the test. And he says, what shall I do to inherit the eternal life? And he said to him, what? It, so Jesus comes back and says, all right, what's written in the law? You tell me. And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbour as yourself. That's a very good answer. And Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. So Jesus is saying that is actually a very good summary of what the law says. Shall I read it again? Just in case. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbour as yourself. So this is a summary, if you like, of the Old Testament law, the law of Moses. And Jesus said, spot on, you've done, you've answered this, do this and you will live. But he said, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbour? So it's like, well, of course, all that depends on how you de how you define your neighbour. And so he's kind of trying to create a loophole, an opportunity. And lawyers do that, don't they? But not just lawyers, all kinds of people do that. We try and create an exception for ourselves where somehow we're the ones that this doesn't really apply to. And he said, he said, who is my neighbour? And Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down the road and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, pass by on the other side. So these are two religious professionals, a priest works for the temple, he's doing the sacrifices and all the holy stuff. And the Levite is the one who does all the kind of facilitating of that and making it happen. And um, so he's also a religious professional. So these guys, if anyone, should be helping. But he doesn't. He passes by on the other side. But a Samaritan, who are the outsiders, the people we don't like to talk about, the, oh, sheesh, they're the, mm, don't even know what they believe, Ugh, <laughs> heretics, you know, that lot. Um, but um, a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day, he took out two denarii, which is um, two days wages and gave them to the innkeeper saying take care of him and whatever you spend I will repay you when I come back which of these three do you think proved to the neighbor to be the man to prove to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers and he said the one who showed him mercy because he can't bring himself to say Samaritan and he said the one who showed him mercy and Jesus said you go and do likewise wow We've heard this story lots and lots and lots of times. I just want to say this. The Samaritan is a great example of somebody who's not a pastor, who's not a priest, who's not a minister, a deacon or any office holder within the church. But they come into a situation of need and they are resourced already with by the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Spirit, ready to pour in oil. What does that mean? Good morning, Gabriel. Haven't seen you for a while. Hope you're well. And exams and everything going good. So what does that mean to 
pour in oil. It means that he is already full of the Holy Spirit. We could we could extrapolate and, and make that relevant to us in this way. We could say he's already full of the Holy Spirit. He he was praying and worshipping God as he was en route. So he knows that when he comes into a situation of need, he's got something to meet that need. He doesn't just spiritually or put in oil. He gives money to the innkeeper and whatnot. So he's sacrificially giving, but he's also giving something um beautiful from heaven as well into this situation i love it and jesus is saying right then (laughs) lawyer you go ahead and do precisely that and you'll be doing great and so he teaches us doesn't he the obligations of how to be kind to our neighbors one final little snapshot here verse 38 now as they went on their way jesus entered a village and a, a woman named martha accompanied him to her house And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. Now, this has been the subject of very many heated debates. I don't think Jesus is against Martha. I'm sure Jesus loved Martha and loved Mary, loved the hospitality that they gave. And I think what Jesus is saying, Martha, just don't worry so much. It's okay. We do need to eat. Yes, there's a time for that. But let's just Let's just listen to what God is saying right now. Why don't you just pull up a chair, sit with Mary? That's the kind of thing he's saying. He's not saying the person who just sits at the feet of Jesus is better than the person who helps and serves and makes the food. Everyone would starve to death, wouldn't they? If nobody made food, nobody washed up, the house would become a public health um, disaster, wouldn't it? You know, it'd be environmental health would close it down. There has to be some kind of facilitating and practical work done to make life function even for the most spiritual but there is also a time to just shut up sit down and listen to what Jesus has got to say have an amazing day you guys and God bless you and God bless all your exams Gabriel and anyone else who's trying to study for A-levels or GCSEs God bless you take care